Greetings, everyone. This is Russ Tanner from GlobalSkyWatch.com. This is a special edition of our Monday night meet, except it's not on Monday. This is uh, Saturday, and we're going to be talking to Paul Mack from Australia. We've talked to him once before, and he's going to fill us in on what's going on, and he's going to tell us about uh, what's happening on the other side of the world. Um, Paul, you there? Yes, I am, Russ. Good. Hey, I appreciate you being with us and uh, and uh, taking the time to do this. I know it's about, uh, what, 10 in the morning there right now, right? Just after 10 uh, Sunday morning, so it's a good time for me, definitely. All right. Yeah, it's kind of strange for us because it's uh, 7 p.m. Saturday night, so it's just like, wow, the whole world's ahead of us. So, Well, tell us, um, so what's going on over there? What's What's been happening with you lately? Okay, um, since we, we last spoke and... Um, I guess we, we filled in some background about the January 20 protests um, that we mounted through Australia and New Zealand geoengineering protest. Um, <clears throat> we've been ramping up towards our next quarterly protest, which is April 20th. So that's coming up uh, just a few weeks now. And um, <clears throat> we've been seeing um, some growth building up behind of that. Um, people were encouraged from January 20th to see, you know, many people getting out on the streets with placards and banners and megaphones and, uh, um, you know, greatly encouraged to see that um, uh, those protests weren't, you know, hampered in any way, um, that uh, nobody was, you know, arrested or dragged off the street kicking and screaming for, for standing up for what they believe is, um, you know, a just cause. So a lot of people um, um, just coming into the group in the background and uh, wanting to... Um, you know, engage with the protests that we're setting up for April the 20th, um, but also more so, uh, um, you know, wanting to engage their own local communities at a grassroots level and uh, asking the question in the background, you know, what, what can we do um, where we are in, in our little town in America or, or the UK or our city, um, you know, in, in the USA or, or UK, uh, to, to get out and, and, and make a difference, you know, what things do we need to put in place um, <clears throat> to, to make sure that our protest is, is effectful, uh, effective, and, um, you know, what advice can you give us to, you know, to get, get these things going, get the ball rolling. So, um, <clears throat> hence, you know, wanting to, to come back on the show and, and have a chat with you um, pre-April the 20th. Um, just to answer, I guess, a few of those questions and to help people um, orient themselves uh, to, to essentially what's a new world for a lot of people. I mean, many, many people have never, you know, actively engaged a, a protest mechanism in, in their life, or if they have, it's, it's been, you know, a lot of years ago and, and they're not sure how to, how to go about it. So um, there's, there's a great deal and level of interest and, in, in, you know, if I can encourage anyone... Uh, today, just with some bit of knowledge, background knowledge and advice, um, then, you know, my goal will be achieved. Well, that's good. What, when, when you have these um, events, I mean, this is April 20th, so this is going to come up pretty quickly on us. Um, mm. What can people do to prepare? Uh, do they need to contact somebody to make sure that you bring the right signs or, or, or what? How, how does that work for the preparation? Yeah, well, right now, you know, obviously we're, uh, we're what's the 31st in, in Australia today, so we're effectively 20 days away from the protest. Um, we've been encouraging all of our, our groups, our network of sky watchers throughout Australia and New Zealand in the background to get their, their local um, council permissions and permits and, and that sort of thing. So if you haven't engaged that already uh, at this date, then that's that's something you need to do. Um, straight away. So for for us down under, we go to um, our local uh, uh, police officers and um, they have, you know, a state or, or local um, event planning section that we can engage and uh, we go to them and say, okay, <clears throat> we're planning on doing a protest on this date. Um, here's our route. Here's our estimated numbers. Um, and here's what we're, we're planning to do, you know, from the start of our journey to our destination. Uh, and we lay all of that out to them, and uh, then they come back to us generally and just say, yep, that's okay, you've got a right to, uh, to public protest. Um, you know, please try and stay within that framework 
Um, if there's any changes to that framework, then then let us know. So that that's the the first super critical thing. You know, when you're sort of this far out, you really should have um, that one in the bag already, uh, which is your your permission to be able to protest. Um, all of our protests are framed in a peaceful manner, uh, and we project that up up front to uh, to to the local police that we're dealing with. Um, and we you know we want them to understand that we will work within. Uh, the framework that they set up for us, um, and that you know, it's not going to be something that's that's going to you know, be unpredictable and, and step outside of uh, of that framework, and and something that they're going to have to manage uh, at a higher level. Um, so we do get a police presence at our protest, which is you know, it's a two-way street for us. Um, it keeps us uh, in a safe and, and happy manner, and um, protects us perhaps from any outside um, unwanted attention. Um, which we're tipping we may have this time, um, and and at the same time, you know, gives us a, a direct line to uh, to to be able to deal with anything that, that rises on the day. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's that's a really that's the first critical thing that um, anyone planning on joining us for April the twentieth uh, around the globe needs to do is is you know contact local police event planning um, department. You'll find something in there where they'll they'll have uh, you know somebody who looks after uh, protests and that sort of thing. It may even be um, a council, local council office you need to approach. Um, so it, it will vary from you know state to state, country to country, sort of thing. So um, that that kind of homework needs to be done up front. Okay. All right. Um, is now what about individual people who want to participate? Um, there's a couple different aspects to this. The first thing is um, what do they need to bring, what do they need to be prepared for, and of course, just to remind everybody, we're talking about April 20th. Um, but before, actually, before we get into that, where is this happening? Isn't this uh, happening in multiple locations? Yeah, so we're, um, we're just finalizing um, some of those locations now. We've um, set up a working group in the background to um, <clears throat> engage multiple locations. So we've got, I think, um, about eight or nine locations across Australia, another three or four throughout New Zealand. Um, and we're going to have people in the UK and USA joining us as well. Um, the guys in San Francisco who got out the other day, uh, <clears throat> which was really great to see. It was just so so pumped to see um, um, those guys all get out and uh, and, you know, put some put some feet on the street, um, and, and a couple of other, other sites, uh, you know, through the USA and UK. So I, I haven't got a total amount yet, but it would be getting, you know, up, upward of 15 to 20 locations that we'll be looking at, and um, obviously each, each one of those locations will, um, you know, have a different kind of setup in terms of the amount of people uh, going to it and, uh, and what's required in, in the background in terms of planning. Um, for Melbourne, our, our key location will be um, an address on the steps of the State Parliament, so that's our, our government buildings, our local government buildings. Um, and then we plan a, a march down the main street of, of Melbourne, two main streets, to a, uh, a central square, a Federation Square, where um, we'll give an address to the public, um, given that'll be, you know, sort of a peak time on Saturday morning, there will be literally, you know, thousands and thousands of people around. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a high, um, <clears throat> a high concentration location, um, and will attract attention with, you know, banners and megaphones and placards, um, any sorts of, um, you know, costume type regalia. I mean, a lot of people wore face masks with, uh, with no chemtrails on them last time. Um, <clears throat> that sort of thing that's eye-catching, you know, creates attention. Um, and then our plan from there is to, to break up into smaller groups, into teams. Um, virtually that, that square we were going is on a crossroads, which is right in the centre of Melbourne. It's, you know, very, very busy pedestrian area. Uh, and those teams will then go out with, you know, um, A4 handout flyers on uh, information on, you know, the chemtrail contrail debate and uh, what is geoengineering. A lot of people are just waking up to this new term, geoengineering. So, you know, our goal is to get that information into people's hands um, in, a, in a polite, non-threatening way, 
um, so that they can receive that and um, and you know perhaps take it home and, and look a little bit deeper. Um, and then you know inside of that there's a mechanism where they can come back and engage what we're doing um, you know in terms of our Facebook setup and uh, and our growing sort of online presence around the world. Mm. So that's our route for Melbourne, but I mean, you know, there'll be, there'll be different um, different amounts of people in different routes and different locations. We're trying to target um, um, <clears throat> a government building to start with in, in terms of a, a point of reference. Um, even though they may not be there on a Saturday, Russ, they, uh, they'll certainly know that we've been there because, uh, you know, we've, we've let them know in, in terms of our planning. Um, and then, you know, from there, it's, it's, it's just getting out to wake up the public. That's, that's our key goal is, is just uh, is waking people up. Well, that's great. About now, um, uh, you, I'm sure you'd welcome any other uh, locations, anyone who wants to put together an event and kind of synchronize this around the world so that uh, uh, anyone else can probably, you know, join in on April 20th. Is, is that, would that be correct? Absolutely, yeah. That's, um, you know, we, we've, the Australian New Zealand Geoengineering Protest Facebook page has been um, building relationships in the background with um, a lot of the key geoengineering and uh, chemtrail information partner groups throughout the world. Um, you know, we've been dealing with Dane Wigington from, from geoengineeringwatch.org and obviously yourself, Russ, and, um, you know, the guys at aircraft.org and, and you know you you've all generously allowed us to um, to, to put a, a promotion up on your wall, and uh, inside that promotion there's a an email address osgeo at mail dot com, uh, and via that we've been receiving um, um, contact from from people all over the world, you know, asking that exact same question: you know, how, how can we engage with you guys? Um, what do we need to do to get set up? And you know get us going sort of thing so yeah if anyone's listening you know around right now and that they are keen to get something going in their area and there's there's nothing happening but you know you, you feel there may be people in your area that are awake or, or, or alert then yeah get in contact with us um, we do have or uh, we do have a database that we're building in the background of, of you know people who have emailed us and um, putting them together in ones and twos and uh, once we get you know a few people together who are like-minded and in the same community, then we've got something that we can work with in terms of uh, you know a grassroots um, protest movement, and um, you know we'll support the, the heck out of that um, and promote for you in the background as, as much as we can, and uh, try and tie in as many other people to you as possible. So um, you know that's that's something that's emerging with the group and, and it's growing in the background that we are becoming. A promotion tool and a facilitator to um, enable other people to to be confident and you know um, maybe just shake off some some fear or, or shadows of doubt about getting out into uh, the public arena, which can be a scary thing to do for the first time. Um, so yeah, we're, we're sort of you know developing a nucleus in the background there that would, would assist people too. And we'd certainly encourage anyone to come to us who's interested so we can engage them and, uh, and facilitate in helping them. You want to provide some contact information if people want to contact you and, and uh, coordinate you know, their event with yours? Yeah, sure. So straight away you can go to Australian and New Zealand Geoengineering Protest uh, on Facebook. And um, <clears throat> that's, that's probably our... our key point at the moment. We are working in the background on um, some websites that are, that are coming online. Um, you can also uh, engage us via email at aust, A-U-S-T-G-O, at mail.com. And um, that's, that's our central uh, point of contact via email for, um, for people to, uh, to get in touch with us. Um, so, you know, those, if you go through those two, two areas, we'll be able to uh, grab your information either way. We've got, you know, a database of people who, for whatever reasons, do not want to be on Facebook, and there's probably a lot of valid reasons for, uh, for not wanting to be on Facebook. Um, and certainly, you know, that, that database we'll be using to uh, inform people of things that are going on in their area as and when they arise and, uh, you know, um, you know, put a newsletter out that's updating, um, just so that people have a, a you know 
a sense that you know it's going on in the background and <clears throat> and that they can be in touch with it. Yeah, absolutely, that's great. Plus, um, uh, if you ever want to do any audio updates, um, you know, like just little messages to people, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, um, if you want to hop on with me at any time, even if it's a little five-minute message because you want to uh, just get a message out for coordination purposes before an event, um, we can hop on the, the computer together. I can record it and email you an MP3 of the recording in about uh, 15 minutes. So it's um, with today's technology, it's just real nice to be able to have these tools available. So just keep that in mind. If, that, if, if, if any of these things help at all, I just want to provide web support um, as much as I can. Oh, that's fantastic, Russ. I mean, it's great to know that you've got that as a resource in the background. And, um, um, you know, overall, I mean, engaging this and watching it grow over the last, uh, coming up on, you know, 12 months now, um, it's it's so encouraging how um, uh, engaging everyone is in the background, how, how much they want to contribute, how much they want to help out and assist. Um, there's been, in fact, there's been no... Uh, negative aspects in, in terms of approaching people, um, no knockbacks. I mean, everyone's going, yeah, look, you know, what can we do to, to network together and, um, you know, how can we help you exchange information and, you know, how can you help us exchange information? Um, and that's really, really encouraging to see if we're going to, you know, crack the head on this thing and get um, get some disclosure. Uh, then we need everyone working together as a team to, to, to rise up and... Um, you know, just encourage everyone else at the same time. So um, thanks, Russ. Really, really appreciate having you as a resource and, um, you know, have enjoyed tuning in, listening to your shows. I encourage anyone who's listening to, to tune into Russ's shows. They're great, very informative. Um, the one yesterday on, what was it, KBGA Radio, that was that was just an awesome show. Oh, so, oh I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I just, if anybody's listening, this... Uh, program you're listening to right now is a, in an informal call-in. We actually have a call-in number um, where you can actually call in and ask questions and actually listen on the phone if you like. The call-in number is 559-726-1300, and you'll be asked for a uh, access code, which is 156230. So um, we do this every Monday night, and we have special events like this when events are coming up or when people request them so that they can stay up to date on what's going on. And if you have an event or something you want to talk about, coordinate, make a recording of, or otherwise expose, feel free to contact me at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at globalskywatch.com, and I'll be happy to work with you and, and make it all come together. So now about this upcoming event, um, is there any, what else do you want to share about it? I'm going to open up the phones and uh, question and answer session here in a sec. In fact, let me do this now. If anybody has a question on the phone lines, uh, press star six and you'll be put into the question in a queue. Let me turn that on right now. There we go. So press star six on your phone if you have a question for Paul. Um, so what else? Any Anything else you want to share about this event? And... Um, uh, so people can prepare, uh, and and uh, would you incur? You know, you mentioned something a minute ago before we even go into that. I'm hearing from people that uh, all around who are having events because events are just starting to skyrocket on this subject of chemtrails and geoengineering. That people are really opening up to getting involved in this, and more and more people are willing to listen. Um, you know, it's been ridiculed as a conspiracy theory for a long time. Of course, amalgam fillings were ridiculed as conspiracy theory, and we all know, you know, what happened with that. Now it's now it's an official story, and so many other things. But it's not a conspiracy theory. It's uh, this is something very real. And as someone who smells and tastes the plumes as they descend on us, let me tell you something: I've never experienced anything like this in my life. I'm one of the uh. sensitive people that can smell and taste them. So people are more open. Uh, open to this. So I think you, you mentioned that you're finding the same thing, aren't you? People are listening more and more interested? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Pe people are um, waking up in, in droves now and um, and a lot of them are going, how how blind have I been? How could I have not seen this, you know, previously? And, and once you, you know, once the mind is open to that idea and concept, um, it can't go back to uh, to ignoring it. It's it's a fact. It's, I mean, you said conspiracy theory. It's not. It's it's a conspiracy, right? But it's a reality, and the conspiracies uh, against us. I don't like to use that word a lot, but um, um, you know, when people do conspire to uh, pour aluminium, barium, strontium, sulphur dioxides, 
um, silver iodides, you know, any amount of ke uh, chemicals and biologicals uh, onto the populace without um, full government disclosure and, um, um, you know, without any oversight or, 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 you know, environmental impact studies or, or consultations, then um, that constitutes a conspiracy in, in, in my thinking. And, um, and that, like I said, that's against us. So um, people are waking up to this. Um, we'd like them to wake up faster, and that's the purpose of having these protests is to, to raise awareness. Um, <clears throat> and we need more people to, uh, to, to just bring this thing to a head and, and bubble it over when, uh, you know, when there's a, a thousand or ten thousand of us on the street outside our government offices with banners and placards and waving and chanting. Um, then you know somebody's got to take notice, and somebody's got to start asking this question. Well, why why are you protesting? What what is it? You know, we need to get this into mainstream media, um, and you know, the way I'm looking at it in terms of well, one of the, the key ways to do that is by uh, by activism and by activity and activity in numbers. So um, yes, yeah, certainly more and more people are waking up to it, but we need to wake more as we go. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it, people really are waking up. That's what I'm hearing. People are getting involved in these protests. And here in Maine, we had a woman who went out by herself and took videotape of her doing activism, putting a sign up in front of the county uh, building. And it was just uh, wonderful to see that. Um, so uh, I think next time she's going to have more people with her, and that's that's kind of how it happens. You know, it grows over time. Um, what, what, what would you – oh, by the way, anybody in the uh, – in the, uh, uh, the chat room, if you have a question for Paul, please go ahead and type it in, and I'll relay that question to him. And anyone calling on the, uh, on the phone lines, if you want to just press star 6, you'll be entered into the Q&A uh, ca uh, uh, cache, and I will uh, enable you in a second so you can ask a question of Paul. So, you know, is it really scary being out there, Paul? I mean, people shouldn't go because it's all scary being out in public and, and you're kind of viewed funny. Is that the way it works? Quite the opposite, Russ. I mean, um, you know, I think mentally a lot of people have a challenge, you know, about getting out and, and protesting and putting their, um, putting themselves on the line. But um, if I can encourage anyone who feels that way today um, to, to rethink that and engage a protest somewhere, because you're liberated in doing that. You're empowered uh, in that process. Um, yeah, it's, it's a scary feeling at, at the start, but once you're in a body of people and you look around and you see, you know, mums holding babies and, and you know, mums and dads with their kids along and teenagers and, and you realise that, um, you know, certainly the atmosphere we try to create is a family atmosphere, it's not a militant atmosphere, uh, but you realise that they're just ordinary people like you who've looked up one day and asked the question, you know, what's going on in our skies? Why are we, why are we seeing these, uh, you know, these alleged contrails um, you know, every day the sky pollution that we never had before in this number, uh, in this volume. And, um, you know, why is the government not saying anything about it except the, the, the standard line of rhetoric? Um, when, you, when you're with a body of people who are, you know, out there asking their question, then suddenly, you, you know, you realise that it's just ordinary people, it's normal people, and they're concerned for their families, they're concerned for, um, you know, the welfare uh, of future generations in terms of grandchildren, you know, growing up and what kind of world they're going to grow up in. Um, and obviously, you know, you look a little bit further into the background and, and you see some of the bigger picture about what's going on in the background. And, you know, it's, um, it's, it, it is a scary thing, but it's also a very empowering thing. Um, yeah, you know, that's the feedback I'm getting is that people have a really great time because a lot of people have never done this before they've never been involved in any type of political activity like this before, are beginning to do things, and they're having a lot of fun, they're meeting new people, and they're, they're, once they do it, they kind of get hooked and they just keep doing it. Um, you, yeah. You see the same thing happen? Yeah, catch, catching the bug, catching the bug. And, and you know, I was speaking with um, Kelly Doherty from um, the Kelly Bay uh, Citizens Against Chemtrails and Geoengineering the other day, um, just prior to her... Um, San Francisco Town Hall uh, event and um, was just encouraging Kelly that, you know, there's a feeling that she'll catch when she, uh, when she gets out there and, um, and just, you know, get her butterflies in, in formation and, and, and go for it, you know, give it everything she's got. And, um, you know, she managed to round up 30, 35 people 
and uh, you know, I watched the, the clip on YouTube and I spoke with her afterwards and I said, did you catch that feeling, Kelly? And she's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I got it. I, I've got that sense of what you're trying to impart. And, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very empowering feeling uh, because for the first time, you know, you've, you've sat there all this time and you've looked at it from behind a computer screen. You've, you've you know, you've researched and, and you've talked with people. Um, and, you know, you've, you've been rightly pretty annoyed about what's going on and, and frustrated and angry that, um, you know, insane people who are supposed to be leading and protecting you are allowing um, this to be happening above your very heads, you know. Um, so so when, you, when you get out there, and, and it's, it's a huge relief, you know. It's, it's like, yes, I'm finally doing something, you know. Yes, I'm making a difference. Um, you know, yes, there may only be a handful of us today, but, you know, I'm going to go and talk to some people and I'm going to get another handful to bring next time and, and make it bigger and better. And, and that's what we're seeing is, is the growth uh, of people through empowerment, through protest, uh, through activism, through being active and, and, um, and just, you know, releasing that, that fear that's generated in the, in the background that, you know, ooh, we're going against the government. Well, yeah, well, everyone's going against the government right now. There's people out there protesting fracking. Um, which is all being set up by the governments, you know, and, and I'm looking at those protests and I'm going, hey, there's some great numbers there, you know. Um, we shouldn't be afraid. We have a right to public protest. We have a right to, to speak out in public and, and uh, voice our opinions and our views, and um, it's a completely legal framework that we're working in. Um, there's nothing to fear. I mean, you know, um, we've got everything set up in terms of all of our I's and T's dotted and crossed. The Melbourne protest, we had, you know, five police officers uh, maintain a presence with us, so um, there was a security aspect from that point of view. So um, I think just noting there's a couple of people in the queue there that look like they might want to have a, a bit of a chat from being on the outside there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, what we're doing is, is legal and, um, and legitimate and, you know, is, is a right thing to do. Uh, if good people don't stand up, then evil will prevail, you know. When good men do nothing, that's what happens. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we're just ordinary people. We're just good men and women of, of the earth and the community who just want some answers to some questions. And, you know, there's nothing to fear in asking that. So Absolutely. And I think people are changing the way they look at government and rightfully force. So government is your contractor. You have contracted with a group of, of people to provide a few services for you. Okay? And they're all, they should be working for your benefit. They should be always working for your benefit. They are your contractor. They exist by your consent. They are created by your consent. Uh -huh. So if we start viewing government as as our contractor, they work for us. And this isn't a you know this isn't a theory or something to make people feel good. This is the literal fact of the way it is supposed to be. It is not supposed to be uh, someone that kills people, uh, sprays people. Uh, destroys our land, quite the opposite. We're supposed to be having a completely different uh, <laughs> different response from our government because they're supposed to be protecting and always working for our benefit. Um, we've got a couple callers who uh, want to uh, ask you a question. Uh, let me go ahead and take the first call here. Sure. Hi, hey, caller. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. This is Mark in southern Utah. How are you? Hey, Mark, really good, mate. And yourself? Doing just fine, thanks, um, in spite of all the spring that we get around here. Uh, just a thought. I haven't been to a outdoor-type protest yet. I live way out in the sticks, and uh, but that's probably going to change one of these days. We're a couple hundred miles from Las Vegas, and I've got some ties to San Francisco, and maybe we'll go back for a visit on one of their protest days. But I just had this thought that if we made a – and we can tell people about the chemtrails and point at the sky and they can look, and, you know, it's not really seemingly affecting them. But I was imagining a kind of a simple flyer we could put together. And uh, I'd be glad to work on this with you if you think it's a good idea. And that would be something that would start off by saying that, um, oh, 15, 20 people, friends of ours here in Melbourne have sent rain, recent rainwater samples in to see if there's any problem with it. And in fact, we all, we, the samples have come back with heavy metals like barium, aluminum, strontium, and here's the actual results, you know, not getting real scientific, but just showing on this piece of paper that these are recent tests and our rainwater is in fact poisonous and that this is the same stuff that's floating around in the air that we're breathing. 
And then the flyer could go on to say that, well, here's some of the effects that people are having. And Russ has made a good list on his website. Here are some of the effects that these heavy toxic metals at the nanoparticle size getting into through the blood, the blood brain barrier, etc., can do to the human body. Ring of the ears, gastrointestinal, etc., etc., etc. Just to let them know that what we're pointing out in these con the, the, the chemtrails, the geoengineering, this is actually, because they're going to go, well, what proof do you have? And so if we could provide a little proof that's kind of, it's powerful stuff, but we, we don't present it too scientifically, just kind of in a gentle way that every person and my friend, 20 people have got together and we had our rainwater tested, and here it is. And what are your thoughts on that, Paul? Oh, look, Mark, I, I agree 100%. Um, I don't claim to be a scientist uh, in any way, shape, or form. I've got no formal scientific training uh, or background, and, and um, you know, I get a lot of people trying to ask me scientific questions. Uh, but I, I agree 100%, and we're doing this right now in Australia. We're doing it in the UK, and I know it's happening in the US and, and in New Zealand where people are going out and having their rainwater tested, their soil tested, uh, they're having blood tests, they're having uh, hair tests. And um, we are seeing reflected in those tests high concentrations of aluminium, barium, strontium, um, sulfur dioxides, um, those sorts of things. And, and, you know, they're not naturally occurring or, or forming um, substances um, in the environment that they should affect us at, you know, high, high levels. I mean, we, the levels that, you know, we should be receiving a concentration of 0.4 something parts per million, we're seeing 4,000 parts per million, um, you know, and higher uh, concentrations. And, and, you know, it's anecdotal evidence if you if you want to look at it. Um, and if you collate it over a, over a wide area and you get a bunch of people with tests like that um, and they're all pointing in the same direction, then, yeah, you've got a very powerful tool uh, to to you know indicate that something is happening, and you believe that something is happening is is, is you know geoengineering and stratospheric aerosols being sprayed in the sky, and highly reflective particles being used as, as space shields and and that sort of thing, um, eventually falling to the earth and contaminating the earth. Um, there's plenty of of anecdotal scientific evidence that can be uh, generated through testing. Um, you know. You can, you can look at some of the polymer fibres that are falling from the sky and take that for a, a direct test. There's a real eye-opener. We've got a couple of those on the go right now. Um, you can take uh, fauna and, and flora, fo foliage that you're finding dying uh, you know, out in the forest. I went up into um, the hills around the, the local area where I, where I live over the weekend and, and I was just um, I was dismayed to see the amount of death in, in terms of trees dying and and you know we're, we're right at the end of our winter now and it's we've had a reasonable sort of rain and a few heated, heated uh, sorry uh, right at the end of our summer coming into autumn um, we've had a reasonable amount of rain and uh, you know some fairly hot times but nothing that would would do the damage that we're seeing uh, you know in our in our trees and forests so yeah Mark I, I agree you know like it, you've got to got to spend a few dollars here and go and get those tests done you know test the water on your property uh, test the soil on your property go go to the doctor and order um, you know tests uh, for your blood and your hair and and that's going to cost you a few dollars but that evidence is powerful when you uh, when you collate it put it together and um, and get it out to, to, to people and, and show them it's it's a it's a wake-up call you know it has to be so um, we've got a few you mentioned a flyer up front that you're talking about putting together. We've got a few things in the background um, that we've, we've already got together. Uh, I'd be happy to share. So if you want to email me um, at osgeo at mail .com, um, then, yeah, I'd love to talk with you and uh, share that information back down to you and then we can perhaps adapt it to, um, to your local area and, uh, you know, help you use that as a tool to, um, to go and educate people in your community. Yeah, plus if we've got, um, we, uh, on the globalskywatch.com website, we have a link at the top called Resources, and in there we have a growing collection of posters, letters, um, clothing, bumper stickers, all kinds of stuff that you can use. So if anybody has any posters they want to donate, just email them to me, uh, and uh, I'll be at the Global Skywatch website. Uh, email them to admin at globalskywatch.com, 
and I'll be happy to post them there for everybody to uh, to have access to. So, caller, any, anything else? Yeah, just 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 popped into my head since I live in kind of a small area. There's probably I don't know a total of six, seven thousand people in the whole county. Um, I got through to everybody by doing a, a newspaper article, and they published it for me in, under the letters to the editor. And a lot of people I, I bumped into said, "Oh, you're the one. You put that up. You put that article in the paper, didn't you? It's interesting." And blah blah blah. Well, and I did have one de detractor come along and say, "Oh, it's just a bunch of conspiracy theory crap." And it took him two weeks to get that in there, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, I think what I'm going to do because I'm not going to go door to door putting out flyers. I would do that at a gathering, like in, you know, in a big city. But I'm going to put in chemtrails part two, and in part two. Because the first time we talked about it, Paul, it was kind of interesting. My wife called the, an Air Force base, and they didn't want it. They said one gal said, I can't talk about it on the phone. Another one, some other guy came on and said, yeah, they're, they're called chemtrails and blah, blah, blah. So I put that in the paper. But what I want to put in the paper the second time, which I'd like to see on these flyers, is that, look, folks, you may think this is a conspiracy theory, but here's my rainwater test, and we've got barium and strontium, and here's the numbers. And this is what the government says is this is, you know, whoever they are, CDC or FDA, whoever it is, comes up with these numbers, this is supposed to be a safe amount that we can tolerate, and this is what's in the rainwater. And it's probably even more concentrated in the air where this rain picked this up. And then I'm going to do, a, I think, a second article on a newspaper and follow up with that to start giving them some concrete evidence. Because well, not only that, that you, the thing I really like about what you're doing is uh, that you, um, you're letting people know they're being harmed because people don't even realize it. People are sick. They have respiratory problems, frequent illness, suppressed immune systems, all kinds of things that could be related that are that are very, very uh, clearly related to uh, heavy metal toxicity or aluminum toxicity, and they don't know where it's coming from. So, let, educating them in that respect is, is a great idea. What do you think, Paul? Oh, absolutely, Mark. Uh, you know, that's a very, very powerful thing to do, and uh, I'd encourage anyone out there who just heard what you said to to go and engage what you're doing and. Um, and you know, put another voice into the community. Um, and if you have the luxury of, of a local uh, newspaper that's publishing you, then I'd be um, I'd be maximising that advantage while you've still got it. Um, we've sent a lot of information through to our local and state newspapers, and uh, it, it just doesn't get published. It just gets you know lost on the editing room floor somewhere, mm -hmm. um, or a negative response comes out of it. So um, yeah, if you've got a, an avenue like that that you can. Um, that you can utilize then yeah engage it and find other people in the community uh who will also you know support you in that and engage it and it's like throwing the, the pebble in the pond you know it starts as a ripple um and it spreads out so you know be that pebble in the pond mark that's you know we need dame wigginton calls it the, the flaming arrows you know like shoot flaming arrows off into into everywhere like don't just send it to the local newspaper i mean if you might have uh, beekeepers in your area um send something to them. I mean, they know their bees are dying and they want to know why. Um, you know, any local communities and organisations and, and things like that that you can get this information into the hands of, um, it starts waking people up. You know, they do put two and two together. They go, you know what, I've had respiratory problems, you know, and I've been feeling really under the weather and, um, you know, I've had aches and pains in, in, in my joints and I've had this ringing in my ears and I've not been able to explain it. Um, as soon as you start putting information out there like that, people grab it and they, they're not dumb. They can put two and two together. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd encourage you, Mark, to, to just keep doing that and uh, and don't stop, you know. Don't stop okay. doing it. Just Absolutely. Laugh. Yeah, thank you so much for those just suggestions and, and for what you're doing, putting the stuff and the information in the paper. That's great. Yeah, I'll send you the – whatever I write up, I'll send to you. And just lastly, I want to say, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. And by the way, you are an excellent, excellent spokesperson. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate that. I'm a bit of a novice still, but um, I'm finding my legs as we uh, go along the road. So hopefully we can improve uh, on, on where we are from now you know, into the future. Absolutely. Right. Thanks That's so much, good. Mark. Yes, thank you. Thank you so and, uh, yeah, I have to back him up. I mean, you sound like you've been doing this for just years. Uh, Paul, you come off like a pro. I've, you know, I've got a little bit of public speaking history in the background, but... Um, no, nothing that uh, approaches this yet, but yeah, so, you know, as I said before, it's all, it's all about just getting your butterflies in formation. I mean, everyone's nervous and everyone has fears and things like that, and um, it takes a lot for some people to overcome them, but um, they can be overcome, and, um, 
you know, I'd encourage anyone who's, who's thinking about just getting out and speaking out to do it, you know. Um, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but we need more and more people to do it. So yeah. um, this is not my forte. It's, I'd rather be doing something else on a Sunday, Russ. I'm sure many of us would be. But um, if nobody else is going to speak out about geoengineering and uh, uh, covert government aerosol programs, then, um, then I'll certainly put my hand up to do that. Excellent. I'm glad you did. Um, I, I'm, I feel the same way, too. I really don't want to be doing this, but I have to. Um, I suffer severely from chemtrails. Um, in fact, I, they almost killed me a couple years ago, um, and I see everybody sick around me, so somebody has to speak up. I'm not, a, I'm not a trained speaker in any way. Your history of speaking definitely comes through, but uh, we, we have a lot of novices who are, uh, are learning uh, how to uh, conduct themselves and do great work. We have another caller, so let me get that caller on here. Welcome, caller. Hi, How are you doing this today? Is, yeah, this is Ann in Oregon. Um, and a couple, first, just a comment. Yesterday was the first time in months that we had no chemtrails, no nothing. It was clear blue sky. And 90% <laughs> of all my symptoms went away instantly. So, boy, if that isn't a testament. And at noon today, everything they sprayed off the coast, and they were doing chem bombs all day off the coast, and they've been coming in with heavy harp all afternoon. And within half an hour of them appearing, bang, here come the symptoms back again. So you talk about testimony. I mean, first time I slept last night in months, slept all the way through. Uh, <laughs> you can't tell me that isn't that. I mean that it in one in one way it just pisses me off. Really makes me angry to know that it is simply a matter of not having chemtrails. But yeah. the other, you know, the other comment. What I wanted to do when when Paul when you said the whole thing about fracking, and that that is sort of in combination with that you can use this um, to also say, talk about chemtrails, look up. And then, you know, Russ, as of this afternoon when I looked online, there is a storm brewing about the MPA. The, and if Paul doesn't know what this is, this is the Monsanto Protection Act. Uh, people, yep, yep. people are coming apart at the seams and this is perfect for us this is just absolutely perfect to say that this was put through secretly with you know I mean literally anonymously it was put in there without any even the people voting on the act didn't know it was in there many of them many of the people didn't even know that this was in the bill, the funding bill that went through. And I think it will be a perfect opportunity. It, it's sad to say it, that this, is going, this could be the hundredth monkey. This could be the, the opportunity to step out there when these, because the demonstrations are already starting. Mm. Um, yeah, yep. well, that's, certainly, that's and, um, you know, it was very nice of um, Barack Obama to, you know, get his senior FDA uh, advisor, who happens to be a former VP from Monsanto, to um, advise him about, you know, how cool Monsanto's products are and sign that into legislation in your country, uh, you know, again, without any public consultation uh, and surreptitiously at the same time. So, um yeah, look, I mean, all these things are interconnected. If you want to put it under an, an Agenda 21 umbrella, um, then, yeah, you'll see that um, ev everything that we're doing is, is, is connected. Obviously, our focus is uh, geoengineering and stratospheric aerosols, chemtrails. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's all connected. And, uh, and I think at the end of the day, some of our protests uh, are going to be connected as well um, in terms of... Uh, you know, we can piggyback off a larger protest uh, by having a, a presence um, 
from a geoengineering pro, uh, protest perspective, an alliance uh, that's formed there. So uh, our numbers serve to, to support other numbers and, and vice versa. Um, we're happy to support any, you know, any um, any protest that's along these lines. I mean, we're, we're talking about genetically modified organ organisms, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about, you know, geoengineering in terms of fracking uh, the planet. It's a, another geoengineering uh, or aspect of geoengineering. So, you know, the, these things are all interconnected, Anne, and, um, you know, while we try to maintain a, a, a complete focus on what we're doing with geoengineering and, and stratospheric aerosols, because not enough people are awake to that specifically. Um, yeah, we're certainly happy to, to piggyback in on uh, on anyone's protests, um, given that there's the right environment for us to do that in a safe and peaceful manner. Right. Yeah, and Anne, uh, the, uh, the same thing goes with me when you were talking about um, realizing your health symptoms are connected. I mean, I know you <laughs> know this, but yeah. to have to actually experience it, and I know I sound like a broken record to those people who listen to me regularly or join our group, but uh, for those new uh, listeners who are listening in, um, there are a certain small percentage of the, the population who smells and tastes the aerosols as they fall to the ground, and I'm one of them. And they have a variety of different tastes and smells. I've never experienced anything like it in my life. And I see the people around me get sick. Like my business partner is a great example. Uh, even yesterday it happened. She came upstairs because my office is upstairs. Her office is downstairs. She comes up and says, are they spraying? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're under a bad plume right now. She goes, yeah, I can feel it. So she's, uh, you know, she's learned that since I can smell and taste it, she'll check with me when she's feeling really bad, uh, feeling the fatigue and, and all of the, the headache and the muscle and joint pain and the stuff. You know, she, she's made that association because I can tell her when she's going to start feeling bad because I can smell and taste the plumes. And I see it wow. all. I see it. Yeah, I see it all around. I see the children uh, who, when I, uh, you know, when children are around, I see them start to act up or fight. Uh, their behavior changes. Adults get tired, fatigued. Uh, they become disengaged when the when a plume falls down on us. So uh, yeah, it it makes all the difference. And as far as sleeping, I can't sleep when we're under a plume. That's why my sleep schedule is all messed up because I have to sleep between the plumes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was just astounding that last night, you know, I fell asleep at a normal time around 9.30, 10 o'clock, slept all the way through, up at 6, felt, you know, I got up and I was okay. It was wonderful, and it wasn't this god-awful tiredness. And then, boy, noontime, these big old giant bombs came through, not the trails, but the big old bombs, just huge, big old, and they were all harped, so it was real low. And the difference was just astounding. The difference yeah. was just amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I believe it. I'm one of the people who can also hear the harp hum. As I sit here talking yep. to you, um, I hear the hum. We had uh, several months where we didn't hear it. It went away, and then about maybe, I don't know, three or four weeks ago it started back up. And it's been almost every single day, and it's been really intense for for about the last three weeks or a month. Yeah, it's been that way here also. And I think what the conversation was on the Facebook page is that they were constructing that giant storm in the Atlantic. Yeah, so. yeah, there seems to be a real relationship with these storms and the electromagnetics that they use. Um, uh, we have some information uh, coming from a scientist who uh, is going to be filling us in more is that there is some indication that fluoride is being used in chemtrails because when you, uh, when you uh, disperse real, real fine fluoride particles, you can make them coagulate into larger particles, a much lower number of larger particles, when you, uh, when you douse them with a certain electromagnetic frequency. <laughs> By doing that, um, you can actually induce rain or you can prohibit rain because if you have too many nuclei, nucleation particles, then rain won't form. But if you have the right number of nucleation particles, then rain will form. So it may be a mechanism that's being used uh, to control rainfall, not to mention the fact, of course, that fluoride is bad for you. Yeah, and it, it puts you into this really strange place. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's it 
that's it for me. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Lovely, Anne. Thanks. Thank you, me. Paul. Thank you so much. All right. Jeez. Thanks, Anne. Um, if anyone else has a, a question for Paul um, uh, who has called in, uh, go ahead and uh, press star six on your phone to enter the, the call-in queue. We did have a couple questions in the chat room. Uh, Mona was actually on the chat room, and she said uh, something about mentioning the peaceful protest against geoengineering on the 6th of April, Hyde Park. That's right, Speaker's Corner in, uh, in Hyde Park. Um, the guys from uh, uh, the UK are getting together, and they've got a, a peaceful protest. Uh, so that's April the 6th, if you're in uh, London. So it's next Saturday um, <clears throat> at uh, the Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. And then they'll take a walk to the environment uh, headquarters, which is located pretty close by, and they'll hand out some evidence, um, which I imagine would be, um, uh, you know, what Mark was talking about earlier in terms of the, these guys have been doing uh, testing over there of soil and water as well. So they've got um, they've got that evidence there to, to prove that you know there's high concentrations of aluminium, barium, strontium, etc. So, you know, you hand that out to the public at the same time and, and you know, it's it's a powerful tool. So next uh, Saturday, if you're in the UK, in London, Hyde Park, Speaker's Corner, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, you can catch up with Mona Norman there. She's the protest organiser. Lovely lady. She's a very powerful woman and uh, is very passionate about getting this message out. I can tell you I, I love her passion. Um, she's just a, a real motivator for me and um, and such a wonderful lady to boot. Yeah, she is. She was on with Max uh, Bliss um, on our Monday night call uh, just a uh, week a week or so ago. So if anybody wants to hear that, go to globalskywatch.com forward slash live, L-I-V-E, all small letters, and uh, look through the archive of uh, recorded shows because we record all these shows, and you can check out Mona and Max uh, talking about what they're doing overseas. Uh, someone else had a question. Um, on the chat room, uh, somebody is saying that they're a pilot, and they're saying that they're very interested in this subject and that they uh, have not come across any actual evidence, such as photos, invoices, weights, balancing, calculation seats uh, for aircraft taken into the account, the decreasing weight in chem, uh, chemical tanks into account. If this spraying is widespread, how is it kept so secret? Mm. Yeah, I bet he's an A330 pilot as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, that sounds like a, a friend of mine who's been trying to engage me for some time in, in regards to, um, um, you know, producing evidence in this regard. And, uh, and you know, I've got to be honest, um, point, point blank, we don't have that evidence yet. Um, we want it, we'd like it, and we know it's out there, um, it's obviously out there, but uh, we're waiting for whistleblowers really to come forward, and we're we're getting a little bit of traction with that in the background now, um, where you know people are maybe just feeling a little bit guilty about what they're doing, and and they might be caught up in that complicitly and being uh, held to ransom in various different ways. But um, they're certainly wanting to speak out about it. So we're we're looking for anyone you know in the airline industry, pilots, mechanics schedulers, um, anyone at all to come forward. Um, we believe we've created a safe uh, environment for those people to come forward. Um, we certainly would want to promote to anyone listening in that regard that um, if you approach us that your confidentiality will be assured and uh, we will work our hardest to make sure you stay incognito with any evidence that you share to us. Um, so there I mean, they're all valid questions that, um, that that pilot puts forward. I don't dispute them. Um, I'd certainly like to have, you know, have that documented evidence because if I did have it, then, you know, it would be a sledgehammer that would crack this thing quite wide open. Um, but it's being restrained in various ways and, and forms from, from reaching us, uh, if somewhat slowly at this time, but a trickle can become a flood. So any, any, anyone who's listening who's you know, engaged in, in the airline industry who wants a safe place to come, um, please come contact me and, and you know, or any, any number of uh, leaders around the world who are you know, engaged in this, in this um, environment. Uh, 
because you know we're all waiting for you to, uh, to to blow the whistle so that we can move forward and um, and confront our governments with this information, um, confront corporations with this information, and uh, and really lay all the cards on the table and say, well, look, you know, cat's out of the bag now. Um, you know, how about you actually disclose the, the full amount of what you're doing? Um, because it's it's apparent. I mean, it's blatantly obvious that it's occurring. Even uh, this pilot is not denying that, um, and has admitted as much in emails to me that uh, <clears throat> if it's the same gentleman, that um, that geoengineering does exist. So uh, I don't know how, on the one hand, you can you can put up an argument saying, well, show me the proof about um, you know uh, weights and you know um, mechanisms to to release aerosols, and, and there's theory and conjecture around that. Um, it needs to be substantiated and seems legitimate, but um, I don't know how you can, you know, on the one hand, uh, put that up as an argument, then on the other hand, um, come come out and say that, you know, you recognise that geoengineering is real and it does exist. So, um, good yeah. question, Mr. A, Mr. Pilot, whoever you are. <laughs> we'll talk one day, no doubt. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to respond to that too. Um, uh, the The jets that we first saw, I remember the day it started in Jamestown, New York, um, being a sky watcher myself. Um, jets, you, you don't see jets over Jamestown because the airport in Jamestown can't handle large jets. They just handle little puddle jumpers. Um, the nearest airport of any size is in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is a good hour drive away. So you just don't see jets flying over. And all of a sudden one day we had all these low-flying jets crisscrossing the sky and leaving trails. And I've watched the sky all my life. I collect jet pictures. I used to take flight lessons. Most of my family flies. Most of my family's uh, jumped out of uh, planes and done parachuting. I used to spend time at drop zones. I've gone up in flights with drop zones. I've had pilots call me. I've lived on military bases. I've driven across the United States. I've watched the sky constantly. I've flown every year for, for years of my life. I flew every year and almost always sat in the window seat and watched what was going on. And I could go on and on with my experience and my observation. Never have I seen a trail come out of a jet. But what happened in Jamestown is when they first started spraying, uh, it took about, they were very low, and about <clears throat> 30 minutes after all of the plumes were emitted, the taste of metal and the smell in my, in my sinuses would burn so intensely that I actually couldn't meet with my employees. I had three employees at the time. And I would cancel meetings and just say, man, I can't think. My thoughts are spinning. I have a nasty headache. I can't even, uh, can't even handle it. Uh, and this would, this would coincide with the spraying 100%, 100% of the time, always. And never in my life have I tasted metal in the air like this or smelled it. And it was on a schedule. And I have written articles about this because I've accumulated so much uh, experience because I can smell and taste it and because it affects my health. Um, just a little note I will also mention is that for the first um, six months to a year, the jets that were flying emitting the plumes in Jamestown had uh, uh, red engines and a red tail, and they were otherwise white. They kind of looked like Virgin Airlines. And, of course, like I said, you don't see commercial jets flying over Jamestown. Um, if you ever were lucky to spot a jet, it was at, would be at a very high altitude, and it would only be because it pinged the sunlight in your direction for a second and you were able to spot it because they just don't fly low over Jamestown. Um, so the first six months to a year, they were red engines and red tail. And uh, after that, they were all silver unmarked jets. And to this day, from 2006, when they changed to unmarked silver jets, to this day, every chemtrail I've jet uh, every chemtrail jet I've seen has been silver unmarked. So I, I don't think uh, people who are questioning this should make the assumption that these are commercial jets. Um, I do realize that commercial jets have very strict weight limits. Um, that's not to say that you couldn't, you know, limit the number of passengers and compensate the airlines if you've got all the money in the world like uh, the people who are doing this do. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know the logistics. It's certainly doable, and it's a big project. But nevertheless, the jets that I've seen in the vast majority of people who have spoken with me have been unmarked silver jets, which are obviously clearly not commercial. Um, what about you? Uh, what kind of jets do you see? Um, yeah, well, look, Russ, I'm like you, you know, in terms of the aviation industry, it's always been a passion for me. Ever since I was a kid, you know, and I first started making model planes, and I've always had a fascination with flying. 
um, I'd do everything I possibly could to, to get out to to airfields and uh, you know it's, it's air shows and um, you know go to museums with aircraft in them and, and um, just just I uh, just love it I just love love aviation and, 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 the, and the passion for planes so and doing that and flying as well you know I've done, done a little bit of flying I'm, I'm not qualified as a pilot but I certainly had the opportunity to go up and, and hold the wheel a few times and um, you know, I'd like to, to do a few military flights once once you get a few dollars up as well and some some uh, warbird type type aircraft. But um, like you, I've, I've watched aircraft all my life. I understand them. I, you know, I know how they work and, and function. Um, and it's it really annoys the hell out of me as well, Russ. That something I actually genuinely like as a passion is being taken and used um, in, in such a you know a horrible, terrifying way. Um, our air, air traffic down under is, is a little bit different to you guys. Obviously, um, you know, continental USA, you've got a very high um, amount of air traffic crisscrossing the country and, uh, you know, domestically and internationally. Um, Australia, we're a little bit more far-flung. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing, you know, geoengineering chemtrails happening in our skies, whether that be stratospheric aerosols released from... Uh, jet aircraft, or as Anne was mentioning earlier, um, uh, chem bombs, or what we believe are chemical uh, rockets, or you know perhaps even ships offshore that are releasing these things that they float in on the prevailing breezes. Um, we, we're certainly seeing those things occur down under in Australia. Um, we don't have a high volume of uh, of military traffic, um, although we have noted uh, military planes. Um, we don't have a high volume of civilian traffic or commercial traffic, although we have noted commercial planes. And we have noted uh, unmarked planes as well. So we believe they're using all three of them in, in Australia and certainly New Zealand to beef up um, the volume. Um, we're certainly seeing massive amounts of uh, stratospheric aerosols or chemtrails in our uh, main aircraft corridors. If you take a direct line between Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, um, that's you know one of our main main aircraft corridors. We've got people that live under those corridors that can go out any time of day with a camera, and uh, and you know take shots of chemtrails happening right above their heads. In fact, we had a day just recently where we counted no less than 37 in I think about six hours, um, and the majority of those were marked on flight radar as commercial airline flights. They were Qantas flights, they were Virgin flights, they were Tiger Airways, they were, um, you know, any, any number of other airlines that, that fly our routes. We get um, large commercial overflights like Singapore Airlines is, is a real contributor. Air New Zealand's a real contributor for, you know, when they're overflying the country, um, you know, Auckland to, to Perth, they like to, you know, leave big trails as well. and. Um, and this is, you know, I mean, we've we've documented this evidence, as I've mentioned uh, recently, Russ, we use the Flight Radar 24 program, um, which, you know, gives a little radar ID to the plane that's flying over the top of you. Um, it gives the altitude, it gives the airframe number, it gives its heading, uh, its speed. Um, we tie that together with relative humidity readings from the Bureau of Meteorology. And uh, at the same time, we have somebody underneath it taking a photo of it as it goes over uh, with a time and date stamp on it that will correspond to um, <clears throat> the Flight Radar uh, 24 program information. So we're 100% convinced that uh, commercial aircraft are, are um, you know, involved in, in chemical spraying over the country uh, and indeed all around the world. So. You know, it's it's horses for courses in terms of um, the traffic that you see in your country. You know, is is much much higher and more advanced than what we see, and, and consequently you cop a, a heck of a lot more of uh, chemtrails than we do. Um, but you know, they're using pretty much everything and every anything and everything to to get this stuff into the skies in terms of a geoengineering aspect, um, which I think the majority of this is is geoengineering related doesn't mean, however, they can't use them for, for biologicals and other things uh, as and where they see fit to. So, um, it's, yeah, that's pretty much our situation down under. Yeah, the thing, uh, the thing that, uh, that, I, that I imagine in thinking about this is um, there must be uh, a lot of commercial um, 
uh, participation because this is just so widespread. I don't think there are enough military jets uh, to do this. It, it, there has to be commercial and there has to be contractor participation. Um, mm -hmm. I've, yeah, in doing this, it just, it just seems like it would have to be because it's just so widespread. The other thing is about trails coming out of jets. You know, I mentioned before that in my entire life, in collecting pictures and being in uh, drop zones and, and taking flight lessons, flying across the United States every year, driving across the United States, and on and on and on. I've never seen a trail come out of a jet engine, not ever, not once, never. And I've had pilots call me. In fact, the last one who called me, and I invite pilots to call me if you want to tell me what your experiences are. Um, last pilot who called me was um, uh, 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 the husband of a woman who actually flies for a carrier, and he flew just as a hobby. And uh, she was flying for like 25 years with a the, with the carrier. And uh, he said, I just wanted to thank you for, you know, just thank you for what you're doing because we've been flying for, you know, 25 years, my wife and I, and we've never seen a trail come out of a jet engine before all this started. And uh, I had uh, another pilot call me as well and say essentially the same thing. So... Um, you know, and, and also the, the, the conditions that are required for, con, you know, contrails to form are so rare that most people will never see one. And this is why, even though I was a sky watcher all my life, lived on military bases, lived in large cities near airports, uh, grew up in the Tampa Bay area, which is one of the largest, most busy airspaces in, in the world, um, I've never seen a trail come out of a jet. Never. Uh, never seen it uh. happen. And now you can't find a jet without a trail hardly. You know. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the disinformation agents would have us believe that contrails are uh, very common, and you're in fact right, Ross, uh, Russ, they're, um, they're not. They're not common at all. The, the conditions are rare to create them, um, but they do exist. I mean, you know, uh, uh, contrails are a real, um, you know, scientific uh, reality and, and we have to take that into consideration with, with um, you know, how we, we present our information. can't all be one-sided. Um, but, yeah, it, it is being beat up as being uh, far more prevalent and common and, you know, with the increase in air traffic, of course we're going to see an in increase in contrails and, uh, and that's what you're seeing. But that's uh, it's pretty much far from the truth and um, the more and more that line is espoused, the more far-fetched it gets and I think people are waking up. Uh, to the the chemtrail contrail um, debate and, and realizing that um, you know contrails are not as common as uh, these people would like us to believe they are um, you know and, and just to, actually while we're on there Russ I've noticed a lot of our guys or a lot of people online I won't say our guys but a lot of people online at the moment are putting up photos of aircraft test weights and I believe this is doing us a great disservice in getting our message out there. Okay, now you're talking about the big canisters that there's that are inside the fuselage, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're seeing photos of, of, of canisters inside aircraft fuselage, and you know they're they're wired up with orange uh, cable and um, you know pipes and tubes and computers, and uh, it all looks pretty spiffy. If you don't know anything about the aviation industry and how they test aircraft, um, and and you know you're just coming in from a completely, hey, this is a tank and, a, and an aircraft that's spraying us with this stuff point of view, um, then you need to understand that these these items, these test weights, are legitimate um, aircraft technology and they do use them to balance aircraft and shift, uh, shift loads and weights around uh, to test flight performance envelopes and, and different centre of gravities and it's a, it's a legitimate thing and it's just starting to annoy me because we're seeing so many of these photos coming out now and people are point blank labeling them as uh, chemtrail canisters and mechanisms and I think that does us a great disservice it allows our our opponents in this discussion to just groan and roll their eyes and go gee you know you dummy you don't know what this is at the same time not saying some of this equipment can't be used for that and and, and hidden or camouflaged in the same way but I think until we get you know proper legitimate evidence that we can present in a, in a cohesive fashion that uh, the people who are out there bashing this particular topic with photos, um, you know, if I could just encourage you to ba maybe go and do some homework on that and research it and, and you know, um, understand that, you know, a legitimate thing is presented there and, um, and that that's actually being used counter uh, to what we're doing, to, to counter what we're doing and, and, and stop us from 
um, you know, getting legitimate information out there. So yeah. it's just a little bugbear that's sort of been burning for the last couple of months, um, Russ, so I just sort of mention that in context of, yeah. of what we're talking about there. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, that's a great point. So, you know, and, and, and like you said, we don't know that maybe some of them are legitimate, uh, you know, chemical dispersing tanks, you know, but we don't know. Uh, we it cer- Certainly many of the pictures I, I have seen, uh, you know, have you can see out of the window of the aircraft. There's crowds of people out there, and it looks like, uh, you know, there are people standing around and turning knobs and working on computers and stuff. So it just seems uh, seems like uh, test operations and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I totally get what you're saying. I do want to say one more thing about the contrail thing is, and, and I say this over and over on, on our recordings because it's critical because. What the disinformationalists are trying to do right now is convince the world that the short trails are all condensation trails. And I just want to remind everybody and, and make all of our new listeners aware that I, I had a very, two very important experiences with this. Um, first of all, I uh, saw all the long persistent trails turn non-persistent after a four-day break of no spraying in Jamestown. This was back in... Uh, uh, 2006, maybe 2007, around that time, uh, they, they, all the trails stopped for four days. And this is after daily spraying covering the sky. And on the fifth day, they all came back. They sprayed on the same schedule. They produced the same chemical taste and metallic taste and odors in the air, uh, all the same physical symptoms, but all the trails were short. So clearly, they did some kind of equipment change that made the trail short, uh, I'm sure, so they were less visible to the public. Now, if that if that wasn't enough, I moved to Bangor area, Maine, uh, to get away from the heavy spraying in Jamestown because there uh, I was very, very sick, and I, I couldn't function. I was getting to the point where I just couldn't function, and so I had to leave. And I came to Bangor, and they were I saw the same thing. Uh, they started up really heavy spraying, uh, covering the sky day after day, and after uh, after a couple years of this, or about a year, year and a half uh, of this, suddenly, suddenly one day, there was no four-day break. Overnight, all the trails were short, with a few exceptions, maybe four or five days a month that we see long trails. But otherwise, all the trails were short. The odors in the air, the spray scheduling, and the physical symptoms all remained the same and occurred at the same times on a schedule, but the trails were all short. So there's no no question that they're they're using new equipment to try to keep this out of the public's eye by making the trails short and then telling the public, oh, these are just contrails. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I agree with that. Uh, I agree with that, Russ. In fact, I received an e- email from um, my pilot friend who likes to send emails to me occasionally. Just recently, uh, it was very tongue in cheek, saying, you know. Uh, almost I dare you to go and look at this, these planes that we've been tracking, which were specifically um, some Qantas flights, Q63 and 64. I dare you to go and look at them and, uh, and you know, and, and get a picture of, of, of a chemtrail coming out of the back of them. And virtually since he sent that email to me, uh, we've seen nothing. One time. And two, two short trails, one long trail. Uh, that was both on the 64, which flew over the other side of where I live. But um, literally, that's been six to eight weeks now, and nothing has come out of the back of that. So it was a very tongue-in-cheek uh, email that was sent to me, I think. But you, you're right. Um, you know, there's there's good anecdotal evidence uh, through Australia right now. We're all talking about the same thing. We noticed the difference in trails. They're obviously um, compiling them or ejecting them in a different manner, in a different format, and that's being deliberately done to, um, you know, diffuse the growing concern about uh, uh, what we're seeing. I mean, even if these aren't chemtrails, like if you just argued this one point and said, well, if it's not chemtrails, then why do I have to put up with this air pollution over my head? If my car was doing that going down the road, um, the EPA would pull me over and I'd, I'd have to go and fix that. Why, why is there no regulation for uh, the aircraft industry or airline industry to um, stop smoking aircraft, you know? Um, you know so, but, yeah, so you're right. They're, they're deliberately um, manipulating them now to, to make them appear as a legitimate contrail and arguing that contrail science uh, till they're blue in the face, which is, as far as I'm concerned, they can keep arguing. It's a waste of breath uh, to my ears. But, 
obviously we're we're trying to educate people um, to the reality that uh, you know you're being disinformed and misinformed. So yeah, they're definitely. Um, definitely altered the, the, the substance that is coming out in terms of the, the mix and making it look like that. That's that's pretty well obvious to yeah. to anyone who's been watching this for uh, for any length of time. Yeah, and as someone who can smell and taste them, and I've heard from, from a lot of people who can, um, uh, just for the new listeners, it's not, for the people who can smell and taste them, who have a very sensitive sense of, of smell and taste, it's not like we're reaching for something to smell or taste. The odor and the taste is absolutely overwhelming. I have to wear a wet washcloth over my mouth uh, when plumes descend on us. It burns my sinuses. It gives me an instant headache. I have instant uh, uh, physical symptoms from it. And I've even timed it. And I've been doing this for so, over seven years now where a jet will go by. If, if one sprays at low altitudes, if they're real low, 20 to 40 minutes later, the plume will descend on us. And I've, I have timed this many, many times. The particulates, the cloud, you know, may spread out or stay up there if it's a persistent trail or it may not. Uh, if it's a non-persistent trail, it'll disappear. But many, many, many times I've stood out there and timed how long it takes for the smell and the taste to reach the ground. And even if the plume stays aloft, something is falling down out at a pretty rapid pace. Something's falling down. And in, 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 in so just I give my word, I am telling the absolute truth to the skeptics out there. If you're a legitimate skeptic and you just don't know anything about this, not only myself but any other people who can smell and taste this, uh, these things that are, that are coming down on us, not only do we smell and taste them, not only are they overwhelming, but we've seen the symptoms they cause other people when the plume descends on us the behavior changes in children. It's, this is absolutely real. We've been watching this over seven years. I've had so many people get sick. Many people I know or, fr or friends of friends have died um, of, of groups of diseases. And one quick little thing I'll mention, too, is uh, we had someone on the forum a little while ago mention about ringing in the ears uh, being tinnitus. Um, I had tinnitus severely most of my life. It became worse from 1995 to 2000. I finally discovered I was mercury toxic from the amalgam fillings that were in my mouth. Uh, had the fillings removed, the tinnitus was gone overnight. I had 24-7 tinnitus that was so loud it was hard to think at times. And I had my amalgam fillings removed, and it was gone for four and a half years. It was gone. When chemtrail spraying started, it began instantly and has come and gone as the intensity of the air increases and decreases. If, the, if a strong plume comes on us, a few minutes later my ears will start ringing. If the air clears and gets mild, the ringing will go away. And it's been like that for, for seven, eight years. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got one. I don't want to hold you up too much long. Oh, it looked like we had another call. Uh, caller, if you do have a call, go ahead and hit star six. We'll take one more call if you do have a call, uh, question for Paul. Um, but in the meantime, Paul, uh, we probably should wrap this up pretty soon. Um, sure. I love having you on here, and I love Australia seems to just be really, uh, with your help and guidance, really organized. You're having these events on a regular basis. Uh, what do you want to share with everyone before we uh, shut down? Um, yeah, look, if I could recap on anything, it would just, just be that um, you know anyone listening needs to be encouraged that it's okay. It's okay to get out. It's okay to speak um, your mind in public. You know, you have a right to do so as long as you do that, you know, in a, in a polite manner and uh, in a non-threatening way. Um, that, uh, you know, you, this is your your human right to be able to do this. And if you feel strongly um, about this topic uh, and, you know, that that people are, are try, trying to put this stuff on top of you without your permission, without your um, <clears throat> understanding in any way, shape or form, then, you know, you need to exercise that right to, to free speech. And, and while we've still got it, um, get out and make a difference. Because if you don't do that, if you don't get out and make a difference, you personally, you are almost working as an agent in the background to, to allow this to transpire, you know, by not saying anything. Um, my personal conscience wouldn't wouldn't permit me to sit by and just let this happen and go, oh, well, look, somebody else will do it, you know. Somebody else will get motivated on, 
you know, I was looking around and there was nobody who was motivated. There was nobody out there making a noise about it. So, I mean, that's the only reason I'm doing this. I mean, like you and I both said before, Russ, I mean, it's probably the last thing we'd want to be doing, you know. But, yeah. but you know, if we don't all stand up together, then, you know, we're going to suffer the same fate together. So you can make a difference today if it's just by talking to one person, um, by putting, you know, one sticker up, one pamphlet in a letterbox, uh, one foot before the other, you can make a difference, you know. If you can wake one other person up and they can wake one other person up, then, you know, we'll get a multiplication factor that will kick in and, and we'll start making some real waves with this thing. So um, if that's the, the one thing I could encourage everyone is with today is just, just get motivated, put that nagging little fear or doubt in the back of your mind aside and say, well, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to say something. I'm going to make a difference and go out and make a difference. You know, come and join in the protest. It's a safe environment for you. Um, you know, we had, like I said, we had babies, teenagers, children, dogs last time with us. Um, it was a family fun day and, uh, and, a, and an empowering um, event to engage. And the feedback I got that from, from that event personally from people was just amazing. You know, people were just so so relieved and so just, you know, had an intense feeling of, of having actually done something, you know, and um, and they want to come back and they want to engage that again. So, you know, our next protest is going to be bigger and the one after that is going to be bigger again and uh, multiplication will be on our side there. So, you know, be encouraged and, um, and get involved, get engaged uh, at a grassroots level. We need you. Um, so please come join us. Yes, sir. Well spoken. Could you recap the two events coming up real quick, dates and times, places? Um, okay, so two events, uh, just very quickly. The one in Hyde Park is um, 6th of April, next Saturday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's a meeting at the Speaker's Corner, which is a well-known corner in Hyde Park, and then heading to the environmental uh, headquarters to hand in evidence. It's noted here. Um, and then our, our April 20th protests uh, throughout Australia, New Zealand, US and UK. We're looking for European partners to come on board uh, with that. So if there's anyone uh, with contacts in Europe who are wanting to engage um, uh, a, a global growing worldwide protest movement, then, um, then please come and talk to us at osgeo at mail.com. Um, but yeah, so April the 20th, and that's uh, going to be in a, in a you know a local centre to be advertised on the Australian and New Zealand Geoengineering Watch protests Facebook page in the not too distant future. And how can people find that Facebook pa or, uh, Facebook page? Uh, so just simply, if you're on Facebook, by going to Australian and New Zealand Geoengineering Protest. Just type that up into the search bar, and um, we should come up. Paul, if you if you oh go ahead, sorry. No, no, you're right. Uh, go ahead. If you, uh, um, I was going to say, if you ever want short links, uh, let me know. Um, I can make you know nice little short links that will uh, link people wherever they want, so they don't have to type in something real long, or it can go right to a Facebook group or something like that. So handy little tool we have if you need them, or anybody listening who's doing activism uh, needs them. Um, if anybody wants to call in uh, to our call uh, Monday nights, we are on at 8.30 Eastern Time, uh, uh, 5.30 Pacific Time, 12.30 in the morning London Time. The dial-in number is 559-726-1300, and the access code is 156230. You can also listen to the live stream online at globalskywatch.com forward slash live. We have a live stream in a chat box there where you can uh, communicate with us. You can also listen live and watch a screenshot. I put up questions and things as we go along. We're working out the audio issues with the stream. Some people say it goes in and out. We're, uh, we've been working out this weekend trying to figure out. It's a whole new technology for us. We've done a lot of IT stuff, but this is, this is a whole new area, so we'll get it worked out. Thanks for your patience. Paul, thank you for being with us. Uh, it's always a pleasure having you uh, on here. You're a great speaker. I'm very uh, inspired that Australia is having these regular events. Let's everybody uh, around the world, April 20th, organize something in your area. Contact the Australian and New Zealand uh, Facebook group if you need help, guidance. Uh, they'll send you to the people in your area. 
or you can contact me, admin, A-D-M-I-N, at globalskywatch.com, and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction so you can meet up with the people that you need. Paul, uh, why don't you stick around after I stop the recording. We'll chat for a second, but thanks so much for your time tonight. Oh, thanks for having me on the show, Russ. A pleasure as always, and um, great to be working with you, mate. Cheers. Pleasure's mine. Good night.